18 houses in 23 years of marriage. Chrissy, I don't know if you're here at this service or not, but you're a saint. My goodness. Um, we're going to be preaching today from Ephesians chapter 4, uh, starting in verse 17. So if you could open up your Bibles uh, to Ephesians 4, 17. But I want to start this morning with a little parable, with a story. Once upon a time, in a land far away, there lived a young man named Ethnos. There were a lot of words that people used to describe Ethnos. Dirty, hostile. Some might say dangerous. Most would say pathetic. But the best word to describe Ethnos would be lost. Abandoned by his mother and father, without family in the world, Ethnos was left to make his own way in the world. Without direction, without purpose, without hope, Ethnos resorted to a life of crime. Mostly petty theft, but sometimes more serious and more violent. At first he tried to justify it, but eventually he stopped caring about even the justification. He didn't owe anyone anything. Ethnos lived a life of constant conflict and isolation. He had some relationships of convenience, but he knew nothing about intimacy. He experienced the type of fleeting happiness common in this world, happiness that works like a band-aid over a mortal wound, but he knew no joy. Some people become set apart from the world because they are seeking a transcendent experience that rises above this world. The monks, the saints come to mind. But some people become set apart from the world because they just get lost in themselves. That was ethnos. He had lived this, his life this way for so long that the possibility of change seemed inconceivable to him. As these things tend to happen, Ethnos' appearance came to reflect his identity. You could actually see the brokenness. You could see the cynicism on his face. He was a filthy, broken shadow of humanity. One day, Ethnos was running through the streets of the city, fleeing from an angry shopkeeper who had caught him once again stealing fruit. As he rounded one quarter, he, corner, he ran face to face into the backside of a white horse. As he lay on the ground dazed and wondering whether he should get up and keep running or cuss out the guy who decided to park his horse in the middle of the street, he was grabbed tightly on the wrist by a huge hand. When he discovered who was the owner of the huge hand, his heart sunk and all color left his face. The horse was the king's horse, and the hand was the king's hand. Before Ethnos could even say a word or wiggle free, the king spoke. Shockingly, there was not the judgment in his eyes that he was used to, but there was a new look in his eyes, a look of compassion. At least, that's what he thought it was. More shockingly still, the king called him by name. Ethnos, believe it or not, I know exactly who you are. I know what you've done. I know all about your past. I know all about your present. Believe it or not, I even know your future as well. Ethnos, you may not believe it. You may not understand it. But even though this world may hate you, I love you. And I want to give you a future. And so from this day forward, you will be my son. I will be your father. Ethnos, I'm adopting you into my royal family. Now let me just pause right there and ask this question. How does this story end? How does this story end? Does Ethnos suspiciously thank the king for his mercy, take his certificate of adoption back to his dirty shack, and hang it on the wall like some sort of cheap, empty souvenir that he can see each morning on his way back out onto the streets? Or does ethno Ethnos leave his dirty shack, leave his filthy clothes behind forever? Does Ethnos go back to his old life with nothing more than an interesting story to tell? Or does Ethnos start living a completely new life in the palace of the king with new clothes, a new home, a new hope, a new purpose? I think we all know exactly how that story should end. When you're adopted by the king, your old life has ended and your new life has begun. Change for ethnos undoubtedly would happen slowly over time. That old life 
tenaciously holds on and patterns of behavior are not easily broken. But the direction of his life, the direction of his life was fundamentally different, was fundamentally changed. Every day from that day forward, every new morning had a different direction, a different promise. It'd be fair to say that ethnos was a new person. And this is exactly what the letter to the Ephesians is all about. This letter that we've been studying over the past weeks. The letter of Ephesians is six chapters long. And many people see a clear, tra- many people who have studied Ephesians see a very clear transition that happens in the middle of the book between chapters three and four, dividing the book in two. The first three chapters of this letter Focus on what Jesus has done on our behalf. It's an explanation of the gospel, the gospel that Paul has dedicated his entire life to. So in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, listen, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we are dead in transgressions, it is by grace that you have been saved. Still in chapter 2, verse 17. He came and preached peace to you who were far away, and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. And then there's this major transition that happens in chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verse 1 says this, As a prisoner for the Lord then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received. Live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. In the book of Ephesians, there are 41, give you a little bit of grammar this morning. In Ephesians, there are 41 imperative verbs. You know what an imperative verb is, don't you? It's a command, a bossy verb. There are 41 of these in Ephesians. It's a lot. In the first three chapters, though, there's only one. Almost all of those commands are reserved for chapters 4 through 6. The second half of this book is an explanation of this one verse. You have been saved. You have been called. You have been brought near to God. You've been adopted by the king. This is the gospel that has changed our lives. And so, therefore, Ephesians 4.1, walk in a manner that is worthy of this calling. Walk in a way that fits with Walk in a way that makes sense with the calling that you've received. Walk in a way that makes sense of the gospel. You've been adopted by the king. And that adoption isn't just a certificate hanging on the wall. That adoption is an initiation into a radically new, repurposed life. Mark began last week talking about chapter 4. By talking about how, as a consequence of this new life, we've been brought into one body. We're no longer alienated from one another. We're no longer separated. We've been united and brought together. We've been gifted by God to be a part of the same body, gifted by God to serve within this body. That's what last week was all about. That's what the board on the stage behind me is all about. Because of this new life that we've been called into, because of the gospel message, we have been repurposed to be a part of the same body, serving the same Lord, serving the same purpose out of our multiple gifts. My text this week starts in verse 17 of chapter 4. 
And in this passage, we are told how to walk in our lives, how to walk according to this repurposed life. So let me read starting in verse 17. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live um, as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. He used the word Gentile here uh, to talk about anyone who doesn't know Christ or who doesn't follow Christ. So no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they have given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of greed. That, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Christ. You were taught with regard to your former life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Have you ever noticed how many of life's great moments are characterized by a wardrobe change? Have you ever noticed that? So many of our great moments in life are, are accompanied by a wardrobe change. A bride is always recognizable on her wedding day by the dress that she wears. You could always pick out a graduate on the day of his commencement because of his cap and gown, which I think is just kind of funny, really. Congratulations, son. Welcome to the real world. Now here's a garbage bag and a funny-looking hat to wear for a few hours. Um, so many of life's great transitions are marked by a wardrobe change. We wear clothing that matches our purpose. We, mer- we wear clothing that matches our identity. We wear clothing that matches the occasion. In this passage, Ephesians chapter 4, Paul uses this idea of changing clothes to contrast our life before knowing Christ and our life after knowing Christ. And it's an idea that we find sprinkled throughout the entire New Testament, that in coming to Jesus, when we come to Jesus, there's something about us that we take off the old. We take off the old self. We set it aside. And we take on the new. Like an old worn-out garment, we take off the old and we replace it with the new. And so just like a swimming suit at a pool makes sense, might not always be the best idea, but it makes sense, unless you're a lifeguard, a swimming suit at work never makes sense. Okay? You with me? Or like a 40-year-old still wearing his high school letterman's jacket. Or frankly, a 40-year-old wearing anything from his high school years just doesn't make sense. Or like the tattered clothes of a street kid. Those tattered clothes no longer make any sense once he's been adopted by the king. And so here's the message to us. The old self, the old self outside of Christ is no longer fitting. It no longer makes sense for the person who has met Christ. And it needs to be taken off and set aside. Paul uses three words to describe this old self. I want to go back and reread, starting in verse 17. I'm going to actually read from a different translation, though. I I like this translation a little bit better. Um, He says, Now I say this and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. And in this passage, Paul uses at least three different words to summarize or describe what this old self looked like. The first word that he uses is the word darkened. The old self is characterized, first of all, by a certain mindset that is hostile to God, a certain mindset that is closed off to God. I read this week a quote from renowned physicist Stephen Hawking. And Stephen Hawking said, religion is a fairy story told by those who are afraid of the dark. Well, a New Testament scholar and a scientist in his own right, a man named John Lennox, responded to Stephen Hawking with these words. Atheism... Atheism is a fairy story told by those 
who are afraid of the light. Paul uses the word darkened here, the word ignorance, the word futile, to describe the mindset of the old self. And this word futile especially catches my attention. This word futile has some Old Testament connections, going all the way back to a book like Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament, where the writer of Ecclesiastes judges everything underneath the sun. Everything in this world is empty. It's meaningless. It's vanity. It's futile. And Paul in this text says that the old self has a mindset that is fascinated or captured by meaningless, futile things. This isn't a statement about intelligence. This isn't a statement about intelligence. I know some extremely brilliant people who are not followers of Jesus, and I know brilliant people who are followers of Jesus. It's not a statement about intelligence. It's a statement about what has captivated your mind. And Paul says the old self is captivated by futility, things that ultimately are meaningless, ultimately empty. Here's the thing, though. In the book of Ephesians, Paul's talking to a group of people who are, in most cases, had never even heard of Jesus. This is a pre-Christian culture that Paul's addressing in Ephesians. So, in their world, there were people who were legitimately ignorant and darkened in their understanding of who Christ was. But in our culture, in our day, in our age, a post-Christian culture, I believe that there are at least two forces that work to keep people in the dark. Two forces. The first force is indifference. Indifference. Um, I teach at Ozark Christian College. One of the classes that I teach there is a class on Christian apologetics. Apologetics is simply um, talking about or defending what you believe and why you believe it as a Christian. Christian apologetics. And one of my assignments in that class is each one of the students in the class has to sit down with and interview a person who is not a believer. It's not for the purpose of debate It's not for the purpose of argumentation. It's simply for the purpose of, if apologetics is giving an answer to the questions that people ask, we better be sure that we know which questions are being asked. (laughs) And so it's, it's an opportunity for students to sit down with a person who's not a follower of Jesus and just ask them, tell me what you believe about Jesus. Tell me what you believe about God. Why aren't you a follower of Jesus? Why don't you believe in God? Just ask these types of questions. And I've been given this assignment for numerous years, and one of the things that comes out over and over and over again in this assignment is that most people are just apathetic when it comes to the big, important questions of life. I don't know, I never really thought about God. Or I don't like to think about eternity. I don't like to think about life after death. It scares me, it freaks me out. See, the problem, the problem in our culture isn't atheism. And I've said it from this stage before. The problem from our culture isn't atheism. The problem in our culture is apathyism. We just can't be made to care about the big, important questions of life. Indifference. But the second force that keeps us in the dark The second force that keeps us in the dark is diversion. Perhaps the primary reason why we can't be made to care is because of our appetite for unending diversion. Um, For Lent this past spring, I try each year to give up something for Lent. I just kind of like the discipline of it. Um, And so this past year, I decided to give up um, the radio in my car during this period of Lent. Um, now, I, I told this to a group of high school students recently at a, at a thing that we had over at Ozark, and there were audible gasps throughout the, throughout the room when I said this. This was much, much harder than I ever imagined it would be to give up the radio in my car for this entire period of Lent. And my children were asking me, like every day as they're riding with me to the store, Daddy, when is your Lent going to be over? Um, but I realized in, in that moment, I realized just how addicted to noise and diversion I really had become. My life is characterized by one diversion leading into the next diversion. We trade noise for knowledge. We are trained and trained very well in our culture to invest almost eternal significance in small diversions, like whether our football team won today or, whether, or what genes will be in style next fall. While we can't be bothered to talk about or think about things with true eternal value and significance, we would rather be distracted. We would rather have diversion. So we're darkened. That's the first word. 
The second word that Paul gives to describe this old self is the word alienated. Alienated. This mindset has resulted in alienation, separation from true life that can only be found in God. You know, in, in talking to my apologetics class, one of my favorite arguments or one of my favorite um, um, uh, talks that I'll give for why God exists or arguments for the existence of God is an argument based on human longing. It's an argument based on human longing. C.S. Lewis very famously put it one time that the hunger that I feel, the hunger that I feel, points to the existence of food somewhere in this world. The fact that I'm hungry doesn't guarantee that I'll find food, but the fact that I'm hungry tells me that I've been created for food. I've been created to have this appetite met. Does that make sense to you so far? Now, the argument then goes on to say, I have within me, and so do you, I have certain appetites, certain longings that cannot be met in this world. Longings for things like true justice. I long for justice. I long for true community, true, true fellowship. I long for beauty. I long for, for spirituality, transcendence. Like there, these are all things characteristic of every single person. We have these longings, we have these desires within us, but yet we cannot find adequate satisfaction for all these desires. It's like eating and always remaining hungry. We never find complete fulfillment or satisfaction in this world. The word for that is alienation. We're separated. Paul says we're separated from the life that is only offered in God. Ironically, the person who has become darkened in their mind has also become alienated from the only true source of contentment and satisfaction and life that this world has to offer. The old self is starving, yet alienated from the life of God. The third word is calloused. Calloused. A mindset which rejects the truth, which leads to a separation from the very one who can offer life. This alienation finally leads to callousness, a loss of shame, or what the Bible sometimes calls a hardness of heart. A heart that only seeks its own satisfaction. A heart that has become convinced that the most important thing a person should ever expect to get out of this life are momentary periods of indulgence. The only true sin, the only true sin in a calloused uh, self, in a calloused culture, is shame. Because shame gets in the way of that self-indulgence. A calloused culture will actually pass laws, not against indulgence, but against shame. Shamelessness, just like pride, is one of those things that we grow to detest in everyone else, but yet we can't really see in ourselves. The old self is characterized by a certain callousness. Verse 20. That, however, is not the way of life that you learned when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitudes of your mind, and to, be, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So Paul says, that's your old self. That's who you were. But that's not what you were trained to live in. That's no longer fitting for you as a follower of Jesus. Now we set aside the old and we put on the new. And he has three words to characterize the new self here, quickly. The three words are, first of all, renewed. He says specifically, we're renewed in the attitudes of our minds. There's this common idea that you hear from time to time. That being a Christian means closing off your mind. Living instead in a closed-minded fantasy world disconnected from the real world. And such a statement, such a belief could not be further from the truth. The truth is that to genuinely follow Jesus means an opening of the mind and ultimately a renewing of the mind. Paul says in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, similar idea. Paul says, don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your minds. 
putting on the new self means getting our minds right. I like to tell this, I like to tell this story to all my freshmen that come, that come to the college, especially like leading up to a test day. There was a study that was done in the United Kingdom several years ago on the power of uh, n- negative self-talks, the power of negative pep talks. And what they did was they took this, this large freshman level class, they divided it into three different sections. The first section was the control group, so they didn't mess with the control group. But this group over here on this side, they told them, okay, before we give you this test, we want you to spend five straight minutes thinking about nothing other than what would your life be like? 